Well, we are going to continue in the book of Mark, chapter 12 there. I titled today's teaching, God and Caesar. Regarding the book of Mark, we are still in the middle of Passion Week. At this point in Mark chapter 12, we are either on Tuesday or the Wednesday just before Jesus' unjust trial and cold-blooded murder, just before Jesus Christ is crucified. One thing that is very noticeable here in the book of Mark is that Jesus' enemies, from the get-go, from the moment Jesus started his ministry, they just come at him wave after wave after wave. If you want to look at it in military terms, it's as though they shoot missile after missile after missile, doing their absolute best to take Jesus down and to take Jesus out. They either come to heckle him, confront him, or they try to trap Jesus with some trick questions. This happens in Mark chapters 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 so far. Again, where these religious men, religious leaders come to try to trip Jesus up. They want to catch him slipping. And the goal, as you know, is to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us stand to our feet as we read Mark chapter 12. We're going to read verses 13 to 17. Mark 12, 13 to 17. Starting there in verse 13. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. Notice he doesn't even have one in his pocket. Verse 16. So they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's, and they marveled at him. You may be seated. After Jesus tells them the parable of the wicked vine dressers, which was about them, as you know, and their murderous ways, it was really, if you were here last week, you know, it was a parable of damnation. It was a parable of condemnation on Jesus' enemies, the religious elite of Israel. At this point, they upped their game by trying to find more devious ways to trap Jesus in order to slaughter him. And so they came up with this trick question in which Jesus answered, as you can see, so masterfully. Now, when I think about these devious men, I could just imagine them calling a council, gathering together. They're fed up. They keep losing. They can't catch Jesus slipping or tripping. And so they're really at the end of their rope. And so they come together and they say, what can we do to catch Jesus slipping? What can we say? And then they come up with this trick question. And of course, the spokesmen or the front men, I'm sure they were rehearsing the question over and over and over. So that way they get it right for the public to hear. And so again, they're at the end of their ropes. They're tired of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus already told them all of them are damned if they don't repent. And so they want him dead. But let us go back to verse 13 for a moment and read that. Then we'll dissect every passage to get the full understanding of what just happened here. I know we get the gist of it, though. Verse 13, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. Now, that word catch means to hunt down like a poacher. And so they weren't playing tag with Jesus. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to put him in a net and destroy him like a poacher. They were treating Jesus Christ as though he were a wild beast. 
that needs to be speared and slaughtered. So when you read the word catch there, it really does mean they were hunting Jesus down as though he were a wild animal. In the King James Version, instead of the word some in verse 13 there, it reads certain. So certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians. So that word certain means particular or specific. So it is very possible that the chief priest, after being outraged by Jesus condemning parable, they sent some of their best men to trap the Lord Jesus Christ. It could very well be that they sent their secret weapons, those who were most educated and most popular, some of the A-list Pharisees and Herodians, if you will. That's very possible. And one thing we need to take notice here is you see the Pharisees and the Herodians are now teaming up. They are now locking arms. This is something very suspicious and very fishy. Because on any other day and any other occasion, the Pharisees hated the Herodians. Did you catch that? The Pharisees hated the Herodians and vice versa. So why are these enemies now coming together, acting like friends? Because, of course, they want to take down Jesus. And the reasons why the Pharisees hated the Herodians is this. Pharisees, by the way, means separate ones. And they were a Jewish religious group. And as you guys know, they were very hypocritical. And the Herodians were a Jewish political party. So the Pharisees were a religious group. And the Herodians were a political group or a political party. And the Herodians, they basically supported the Herods, hence Herodians. They supported King Herod and his wicked family, all of them. And the Herods were not pure Jews. And they were basically puppet kings to the Roman Empire or the Roman rule. And so that's one reason why the Pharisees hated the Herodians. Because, again, there were Jewish people who supported Rome, their enemies, their oppressors, by supporting the Herods, who were non-Jewish kings, who were puppet kings. On the other hand, the Herodians were non-religious Jews. The Herodians were non-religious Jews. They could care less about the Torah. They can care less about the traditions of the elders. They can care less about Yahweh. They can care less about the prophets in the Old Testament writings. The Herodians were worldly. They were secular. They were hedonistic and humanistic and therefore hated the religious Pharisees. In other words, the Herodians wanted nothing to do with religion. And the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with Rome. And that's the reason why they bumped heads like two mad rams out in the fields. The Pharisees pretended to be more about Yahweh God, and the Herodians pretended to be more about Caesar. But in their hearts and in reality, they were only all about themselves. The Pharisees were pretenders and the Herodians were pretenders. They were all about their own self-interest. And they hated each other. They were like the bloods and the crypts. They were like Republicans and Democrats, if you will. But these frenemies, you guys all know what a frenemy is, right? They're, they're fake friends, but they're real enemies, right? That's what they became. They became frenemies. Why? Because even though they bumped heads, they had one thing in common, and that was a genuine hatred for Jesus, the Messiah. And so even though they hated each other, they hated Jesus more. And so that's the reason why they locked arms and they said, let's team up. Let's go at him together. Two are better than one. Two groups are better than one. So they thought. And what was the main reason why they locked arms and came against Jesus? It's because of Jesus's gospel message. It's because Jesus preached repentance and faith in him. And guess what? That message contradicted both the Pharisees and the Herodians. Jesus' message contradicted the Pharisees' traditions and their false religious ways and their hypocrisy, and it contradicted the Herodians' evil, hedonistic, sinful lifestyle. 
And that's the reason why the Lord Jesus tells his apostles, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And that was beware of false religion and beware of worldliness. And that's the reason why they hated the Lord Jesus Christ, because he was not a respecter of persons. His number one goal was to honor God. And in honoring God, he would offend men, namely the Pharisees and the Herodians. If Jesus didn't agree with them, he was at the top of their hit list automatically. So they became frenemies. What we must understand is that the entire world, the entire world, the entire world system, both the secular world, the pagan world, and the false religious world, even if they have some disagreements with one another, they will always secretly agree on their hatred of the biblical Jesus and the gospel message and his church. That will always be the case. The pagan world, the religious world, and the secular world will always team up against the gospel. Because the gospel says, stop working, start trusting in Jesus alone. Everyone else says, work for your own salvation. There's another way to God, not just Jesus Christ. Enemies will always unite against Christ and his church. It happened then and it happens now. This is nothing new. Men who hate each other will, they would hypocritically love each other in order to team up against the Lord Jesus Christ. So for example, has anybody here ever seen religious world summits on TV where all the heads of many false religions come together and unite supposedly in the name of God? You will never find in that summit, in that gathering, you will never find a true representative of Christ. Never. Some of you might think, well, what about the Pope? Well, the Pope is not a born again man of God. He is not a disciple. He's an enemy of the cross. In fact, he even robbed God the Father's name by calling himself the Holy Father, which is blasphemous. But you will never find a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ in a world religious summit like that. And why is that? Because that one true disciple of Christ will speak against their false religions. He will not keep his mouth shut. He would not stand with the enemies of God. And even for the love of their souls, he would not join the party. Religious world leaders claim to unite in the name of God, but in reality, they unite in the name of Satan. Who is the father of all lies, which means that he's the father of all false religions and is the little G God of the entire world. And so when you see these religious leaders coming together, they are really coming together in the name of Satan. They use the name of God, but it's just a pretense. Their God, little g, is Satan. The Bible basically ends with an all out world unification with Satan against Jesus. All true intentions will be exposed at Jesus' second coming. I want you to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17. What we see here is going to happen at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, this unifying of enemies for the purpose of trying to kill Jesus. I told you last week, if man could kill Jesus again, he would. In Revelation 17, they attempt and fail. So turn your Bibles to Revelation 17. We're going to read verses 13 to 14. We're going to go ahead and read verse 12 as well. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. But they receive authority for one hour, that's for a time, as kings, listen, with the beast. That's, of course, the Antichrist and Satan himself. Thirteen, these are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Listen, 
These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. And so we see the Pharisees and the Herodians coming together to try to trap Jesus, to slaughter Him. They're going to try that again. But it's not just going to be the Pharisees and the Herodians. It's going to be the kingdoms of the world. Everyone will gather to try and combat the Lord Jesus Christ with the Antichrist and Satan at the lead. And it says there in verse 13, these are of one mind. These are of one mind. Notice that the Pharisees and the Herodians were not of one mind, but when it came to trying to kill Jesus, they became one-minded. They became one-minded. And what was the purpose? It says there in verse 14, these will make war with the Lamb. What we must understand is, world leaders know Jesus is coming. And they're preparing to war against Him. They know it, but they don't want you to know it. The Bible tells us they know it. It's not going to happen by surprise when Jesus comes and all of a sudden they say, hey, let's get a little team of God-haters together, an army against God. They're preparing for that time. They will be ready for the second coming of Christ. They will be armed and ready to war against the Lamb. And it tells us right there that they will be defeated. The, the Lamb will overcome them. Why? Because He is Lord. He is Lord. That's just to say that He is sovereign. He's all-powerful. That even if all the nations of the world came against Him, they will not and cannot defeat Him. Amen. And you know, there's something really beautiful there at the bottom of verse 14. It says, and those who are with Him, we are with Christ. They are with Satan and the Antichrist. We are with Christ, the champ, the victor, the winner. And it says there that we are called chosen and faithful. That's you. You will come down on white steeds with the king of kings right behind him. And you are called chosen and faithful. Amen. Amen. And so I just want you guys to see that this, this coming together to try to bring down God is nothing new. It is the heart of the world. It is at the very center of the world to come together and attempt to destroy God. Because they don't want him. They don't want him in their religions. They don't want him in their politics. They don't want him in their parties. They don't want him in their schools. They don't want him in their houses, in their families, or in their hearts, or their entertainment. And so if they could, they would kill him again, but they can't. Amen. In verse 14, Mark chapter 12 and verse 14, it says, when they had come, they said to him, teacher, these guys are just frauds. They are liars. They're hypocritical. Teacher, we know that you are true. I could just hear the unheard voice of Satan in the background, you know, kind of using their tongues like Satan used the tongue of Job's wife. They said, we know that you are true and care about no one. That doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't have compassion because, of course, he does or else he would never die on the cross for sinners. Right. But it just means that Jesus never caves in to flattery. They're saying, we know that you're not easily flattered and we know that you only tell the truth. Uh, the, the odd thing about that is that was true of the Lord Jesus Christ. But these men were being insincere. And he says, for you to not regard the person that is the prideful ways of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? In other words, they buttered him up in front of all the public. We know that you never lie. We know that whatever you say comes directly from God. Now, answer us this question. That's the way they approached the Lord. They were not sincere. This is where it can get a little tricky and even a little messy when it comes to this question. If Jesus would have said, yes, do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he says, yes, just yes. 
then it would have seemed as though Jesus supported Rome's sovereignty over Israel and not God's sovereignty over Israel. They would have said, you see, he is a supporter of Rome, our oppressors. He is not one of us. This would not jive with the crowd. This would have angered them. This would have caused the crowds to see him as an absolute traitor, like the tax collectors. But if Jesus would have said no, do we or do we not pay taxes to Caesar? No. If he would have just said no, then he could have been marked as an insurrectionist, a Jewish rebel, a hater of Caesar. This could have gotten him arrested on the spot. So if he would have said, yes, pay, they would have pointed a finger at him and said, he's a supporter of Rome, a hater of God. If he would have said no, they would have said, well, he's just a Jewish rebel. Let's lock him up and throw away the key. And so either way, if you would have answered with a simple question, yes or no, things could have gone south pretty quick. But of course, he, he's omniscient and he is all wise and he is God in the flesh. You're not going to catch him slipping, right? And take note here. Jesus never caved into popular opinions and ideas and ways of men. Jesus never, not even once, caved in to the popular opinions, ideas and ways of men. He was God the Father focused from day one. Jesus cared much more about the honor of his father than the honor of men. That's what they were telling him. And it was true, but they really didn't mean it in their hearts. But it was true of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus would stand with his heavenly father, even if it meant that the entire world would stand against him. The same should be said of you and I, that we would side with God and be rejected by the world than to side with the world and be rejected by God. Do you have that in your heart? If you don't, you need to grow in Christ likeness. If you feel like you have to be religiously correct or politically correct, that is because you're still a man pleaser and you need to overcome that. You need to stand for truth, even if it costs you your life. And one day it will cost you your job. It will cost you promotions. It will cost us church buildings like this. When the government comes down hard on the Christian church, will you stand with men or will you stand with Christ? And this is something that we prepare our hearts for, right? This is who you are in Christ. And if you can honestly look at yourself and say, you know what? I think I care too much about public opinion than the word of God. We'll get it right with God and agree with him above agreeing with men. He's the sovereign. He's the sovereign. No one's better than him. No one's greater than him. No one is gooder than him. <laughs> Maybe that's not a word. Amen. But no one compares to his goodness. Amen. And so why side with lies and liars than to side with the one who is truth, who is the source of all truth, who is always right and never wrong? Our Lord and God. Amen. And in verse 15, let's go back to verse 15. It says, shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why do you test me? And when Jesus asked that question, he exposed their motives. In other words, I know what you guys are doing. Why do you test me? I know what you guys are up to. He says, bring me a denarius. By the way, a denarius is a day's wages. And he says that I may see it. Notice he didn't say yes, and he didn't say no. He said, bring me a coin. What a masterful way to teach people heavenly truth. This was absolute genius on Jesus' part. He did not answer with a quick and straight yes or no, which is what they expected. Instead, as we can see, he outwits them. His wisdom towers over them. What we need to know about the denarius coin is that the coin that Jesus was holding in his, in his hand had the picture of Tiberius Caesar on the front side. We would call that the head side of the coin. It had a picture of Tiberius Caesar with the words engraved, and this was abbreviated around the coin. It said this, 
Tiberius Caesar, the divine Augustus. Another way to say that is Tiberius Caesar, God majestic. The Caesars thought they were gods. And on the back side, that is the tail side of this coin that Jesus asked for, it said this, Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest. And so you have a, a human king, a human emperor, with the titles of God the Father and God the Son. God the Father is God majestic. God the Son is the high priest. And that was one of the main reasons why they didn't like to pay taxes to Caesar, because their coins were full of blasphemy. And it wasn't a, an issue to pay taxes to Caesar for most of the Jewish people. They were oppressed by them, and that's the reason why they didn't want to pay taxes to them. But again, these were titles that belonged to Jesus and not Caesar, to God and not fallen man. As I was going through the study, I started thinking maybe this is where the U.S. got its ideas to place the faces of American presidents on our coins and on our bills. This is most likely where they get it from, because there is nothing new under the sun. Under the sun. And what do our coins say today? In God we trust. But of course, you look at that, you read it, and you wonder if that's still true. Because as I see things, and I'm sure as you see things, we see the one true God being rejected by our government, by our nation, and even by many, many so-called Christian churches. And this is happening more and more each and every day. So does this nation still trust God? Doesn't look like it to me. As a side note, the name Caesar was the last name of Julius Caesar. But then it became a title for Roman emperors after his death. And so Caesar is basically like our modern title for president. After Julius Caesar died, they began to call every other Roman emperor Caesar. Let us read verse 17. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. They thought to themselves, what wisdom. They thought they were going to take the trophy home, folks. But that didn't happen. What wisdom. Jesus is teaching everyone that there are such things that belong to government. And there are such things that belong to God. There are such things that belong to government and there are such things that belong to God. Jesus is teaching his true disciples that a Christian is a temporary citizen of earth and an eternal citizen of heaven at the same time. At the same time. We're in this world, but we're not of this world, right? And for this reason, Christians have a civil duty to pay taxes we have a civil duty to pay taxes. That's what the Lord is teaching them. That's what the Lord is teaching us. As Christians, you pay taxes. Why? In order to help out our nation with the good things that we enjoy. Like freeways and stop signs and police officers and social security. And so you pitch in as a Christian. It is your civil duty to pitch in. And there are times when governments do evil with our taxes. We've heard of that. But we have to understand that that's between them and God. That's between the government and God. As Christians, we have to carry out our civil responsibilities. Our taxes will unavoidably pay for good things and bad things. That, that's going to happen in this fallen world. And yet we're called to serve under even a godless government. I mean, we have some good examples in the Bible. We have um, Daniel and his three buddies, right? In Babylon, under the king Nebuchadnezzar. They served him happily. They served him well. They served their government. But as soon as King Nebuchadnezzar erected a statue for them to bow to, they would rather burn than to worship an idol over God. 
And so at that point, they rejected the commands of government. Why? Because the government was now usurping the role of God in regards to worship. But again, same thing with Daniel. They tried to trap him, didn't they? No one should pray to any God but you, O king. And if anyone does, they ought to be fed to the lions. What did Daniel do? Did he obey the government at that point? Or did he obey God by seeking God's face in prayer? He went right back home and started praying like he did every day, three times a day. It didn't bother him one bit. And that's the kind of approach we ought to have when the government becomes harder and harder on Christians in America. And it's like that in Pakistan. It's like that in North Korea. It's like that in Afghanistan. In fact, uh, when we took our troops out of Afghanistan, Afghanistan took first place for the most dangerous place to live for Christians above North Korea for some time. And so there, there are governments that are, that are heavy handed towards Christians. So Paul reiterates this tax paying civil responsibility we have as Christians. I want you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. We're going to read verses 5 to 7. Romans 13, 5 to 7. You know, in America, we've been enjoying some religious freedom for some time, especially us as Christians. There was a time in our nation when being a Christian was actually popular. Now it's not. And the day is going to come when Christianity is going to be scorned. And everyone who follows the Lord Jesus Christ, those days are just around the corner. But let us read here Romans chapter 13, 5 to 7. Therefore, you must subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now he's talking about how government is an invention of God. And so the government, in one sense, serves as ministers of God, police officers, judges, court systems and so on. Verse six, for because of this, you also pay taxes for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. The government's job is to take care of the taxes and to take care of execution and arrests and so on. That's not the church's job. That was not given to us. Seven, render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to who customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so basically, Paul understood what Jesus was doing at this time and reminded the church in Rome that you got to pay your taxes. We are to obey the government so as long as they don't contradict God's word. We find that in Acts chapter 5 with uh, the apostle Peter, he tells them, we will obey God rather than man because they told them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. They said, we're not going to stop doing that. And even when COVID hit, the government asked us to close for some time. We closed for three months. Then we understood a little more about the whole situation and we reopened. In California, they wanted to keep the church locked down and shut. But what does Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 tell us? Do not stop going to church. And so those who are brave and said, you know what, we're going to obey God rather than man. They opened up their churches and many of them didn't. And they lost their churches because of the fear of man. But at first we were being reasonable. OK, well, we'll shut down for some time. We don't know how dangerous this thing really is. And then as it rolled out, we got some more information and we said, open the doors. Right. right. Lastly. When Jesus received the Roman coin, it was as though he said, who made this coin? Give it to its maker. Who made man? Give him, her, to their maker. That's what he was teaching in this lesson. The coin bears the image of Caesar, but humanity bears the image of God, his maker. That's what Imago Dei means, image of God. You are image bearers of God. We were created by God and for God, just as a denarius was created by Caesar and for Caesar. That's what the Lord was teaching them. He created us with the ability to know him and enjoy his goodness. You were created in his image. What does that mean? You're creative. You're relatable. 
and you can dominate, you can rule, you can lead. In fact, every man has been considered a leader in his home, the head of the house. And in that sense, we're like our maker. But as you guys know, during Adam's fall, that image was marred. It was marred. It was almost utterly destroyed. We can't say it was utterly destroyed because people who don't know God still do kind things every now and then. The good news is, though, God the Father sent God the Son. God the Son sent God the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God comes into this fallen nature, this fallen man, this marred image of God and restores it. So when you come to Jesus, you are now slowly being made into the image of your creator once again, namely like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know what's happening this morning, And tomorrow and the day that follows, you are being made more like your savior and everything you think, say and do. And sometimes it's a slow process because of our hard heads. But at times it could be a smooth process if we humble ourselves and submit. Can I get an amen or an ouch? Some are saying the man's preaching now. I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 29. We're going to read verses one and two. We're talking about giving to God. Psalm 29, verse 1 and 2. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And so we see here, again, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. What is God's? To give him all the glory. To give him all the praise. To thank him always. To acknowledge him always. To obey him even more than our own desires or the ways of this fallen world. Give unto the Lord glory. Do his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In Romans chapter 12, and verse 1b, it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. In other words, give to God what is God's. Give him your body. Give him your time. Give him your energy. Give him your love. Give him your whole heart. Why? Because he deserves it. Honor him with every word, with every thought, with every action. This is what it means to give God what belongs to God. And in our fallen state, at times we're all guilty of robbing from him instead. But may the Lord help us to give him all that we are, to give him our entire life, to give him our entire body, our entire mind, all of our words, all of our thoughts, all of our actions, Lord, Help us in everything. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay your taxes. Give to God what is God's. Give him your whole life. Give him your whole life.